Uh, thank you, Semar. Ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you all. Thank you very much for coming uh, on this miserable morning. Uh, we have this to talk about, which I hope you, uh, I hope you all have a copy of it. Uh, so, look, I'd, I really would like to make, I think, probably only four points, because I think it's rather self-explanatory. Uh, and um, they are similar to points to those which we have discussed in the past. But the first is that uh, when we look at the state of the world economy and we see that, uh, for example, the uh, IMF has described its performance as disappointing, uh, and we see that the growth rate projected for the world this year is 3.1%, and for advanced economies it's down in the 1%, uh, what stands out with these figures is the contrast. Uh, because you have a very low growth environment, as we have experienced for some time, but here in the field of intellectual property activity, we have rather high growth. Uh, so that would be my first point, that it is a measure, if you like, uh, of the activity in the knowledge economy, which is performing at a rate which is uncharacteristic, given the general uh, circumstances in the world. Uh, the second point I would make is that once again we see uh, an increasing uh, dominance almost by Asia as the origin of filing activity for intellectual property. So uh, if you look at the figures you see 62 percent of global filing activity for patents uh, is located in Asia. 55% uh, of global activity in trademarks is located in Asia, and 68% of design applications are in Asia. So uh, this we have discussed on previous occasions, and, uh, and it's a confirmation of a trend that we have been seeing for some time. Now, uh, the third point, I think, would be that when you look at those figures a little bit more closely, of course, Again, I'm sorry uh, to be repeating a message that we've seen, but this is the trend. China, uh, the figures for China are quite extraordinary. Uh, so, uh, it is the first patent office in the world to receive more than one million applications. That occurred last year. Uh, and uh, this is quite uh, extraordinary. It is uh, growing, continues to grow at an extraordinary rate. Um, and uh, the figure for last year was 18.7% in terms of the numbers of applications in the patent area uh, received by China. <coughs> uh, and we see also in their figures, this, you know, the, they are the top. Uh, in terms of numbers, patent office, trademark office, and design office in the world now. Uh, and we see also in their figures that there is uh, an increase in their uh, filing activity outside of China. Now, that's uh, slow and gradual compared to the meteoric rising numbers internally. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it is the case that um, we, we do see more overseas filing activities in patents and in trademarks by Chinese enterprises. Uh, and that is a, a trend that is, I think, uh, discernible. Uh, then I would uh, uh, point you in the direction also of India, which I think uh, has had a, a very solid performance in the last year. Uh, it is. Uh, at a completely different level in terms of numbers from China. Uh, so we're not talking about the same uh, numbers. Nevertheless, uh, we do see uh, a much increased activity on the part of, uh, or in India. So in the trademark field, field a rise of 22% in the numbers of applications. In the design field, a rise of 10.5%. Uh, and in uh, in terms of patents, if you could help me out, Mars or, or Carsten, I've just lost that one uh, from India. 
uh, is uh, 45,000. 45,000 applications. So it's in the top 20 countries now. Uh, so I think um, that is something to watch. Uh, we wouldn't want to suggest any trends at this stage, but certainly um, increased activity in India. So I will limit myself to uh, those comments. Uh, Carsten, would you like to add anything? Not much. Maybe just one observation. I think what we see in the case of China um, is increasingly, you know, the, the laws of the mathematical laws of compound growth. Uh, you know, China keeps growing at a high rate, but since China is at a very high level, that means, um, you know, um, China is more and more driving uh, global filing uh, growth. Uh, just to give you an indication of this, uh, so China in 2015 received a million one hundred and one thousand eight hundred and sixty-four patent filings, uh, which is almost the same as the second, third, and fourth uh, largest uh, office uh, together, um, you know, which are the Japan Patent Office, uh, the Korea Inter uh, in Intellectual Property Office, uh, and the United States uh, Patent uh, and uh, Trademark Office. Um, so, um, you know, that's, uh, um, that's quite a remarkable phenomenon, and at least as far as we can see, there is no um, end to this growth. Mm -hmm. Another way to look at this, if you just look at, you know, last year's increase in 2015, sort of the additional number of uh, patent filings compared to 2014, that, um, you know, is similar to the annual number of patent filings received uh, by the European Patent Office. Uh, so again, these are just um, you know the logical implications of, of compound growth, and you know over the years uh, you know this is what has played out in the numbers uh, that we um, we publish in our world IP indicators. Thank you, Jean Pierre. I have just been flicking through the report. I mean, I, the, the, the table is, uh, is very clear and uh, easy to access on the. Uh, Patents, but on the trademarks, I didn't see the global overview uh, table. Or uh, on designs, I didn't look quite, but I didn't find it in, in the report. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, on page 75. If you go page 75. 75. 75. Yes, you'll find the half. Oh, okay, thank you. So that gives you the highlight of oh, yeah. what is happening at global level. It should be at the beginning of the chapter. And also on page 7, um, you have the key yeah, numbers so for patents. Yes, sorry, 75, there's no 74, but that's for the other section. That, that's what I meant. 75 is the trademark, so that is all the information of the yeah. trademark. No, but there's no table. Oh, the table, uh, the table if you go at the end, for the table, I'll give you the number. It's page 7. Page one, one of three has a statistical table, that's so true. are you looking for that? So if you look at page 7, sorry, um, these are our key numbers and there you find um, sort of the world totals for patents, trademarks, design rights, utility models and plant varieties. Okay, thank you. Page 7. Plus, uh, Okay. And then if you want to have the more detailed discussion of the statistical trends in each of the main offices and across the main origins, uh, that would be provided in the trademark chapter, and that, as Mosaid says, starts yeah. at page 75. Thank you. Catherine? Okay. Um, so, I'm in the report, I read that the lower middle income group share of the world total has remained unchanged over the last decade. So, that's it. it's not improving. Does that mean that they're not interested in patenting, in IP system, or they have a hard time kind of? Increasing their, their capability uh, and ability, and also um, for plant variety protection. Uh, are mm. you talking about patents, or is this including the HUBOF system? Or mm -hmm. So, on the second one, uh, we are dealing uh, here in the statistics <coughs> with uh, plant breeders' rights. So, the uh, specific form of protection <coughs> for UPOF system for uh, plant varieties and not patents that may cover. Uh, some element of a plant. Um, on the first one, look, it's a question of technological capacity. So uh, we regret that you know the the trend is not otherwise. But uh, this is this is the, a reflection of of the I think the technological capacity and of course 
that is something that should concern us all because uh, we do not want technology to be a divider. Uh, and um, we would like to see the capacity of the lower income countries in particular uh, raised in this area. But maybe if I may, one slight caveat to that, I mean, you're right in terms of share, but since the world total is growing, and in particular since you see very fast growth in high-income countries, and especially China, which is a middle-income country, that also means you do see growth in low- and middle-income countries. You know, if the share is stagnant, that does not mean that filing volumes are necessarily stagnant. You've spoken about how uh, you're far ahead of the general macroeconomic trends uh, in the uh, world. Have you done any research on uh, how uh, this general macro figures lag behind um, your figures? You know, because are there any trends available? Or is this because the, the, the fighting that's taking place in countries like Japan? Um, China and India are so new. Yes, so what I, uh, I'm not sure I completely understand your question, but uh, my point would be, well, we're, we are dealing with numbers here in just in fairly, in fairly um, uh, generalised form, but what is striking is that you uh, have a performance in respect of intellectual property activity that is not similar to the general uh, uh, outlook for uh, the global economy or the general performance of the global economy. Now, of course, to say more, you have to break it down and look at specific regions, uh, even specific technologies. Uh, uh, and um, as uh, Carsten has already mentioned, we do have one major driver in, in this, uh, it's not alone, but one very major driver, which is China, um, which does raise the volumes very significantly because the, the numbers are, are quite uh, exceptional. Uh, but going more into detail, I don't know whether you have any comments. Uh, it's, a, it's a complex question, I think, that you ask, uh, Carsten. Um, Maybe the one observation I would make is that, you know, if you think of what is behind intellectual property filing, filings. It's mostly companies' investments in intangible assets, whether it's technology, whether it's design, whether it's branding and, and reputation. And um, we certainly do know from studies that have been conducted that um, intangible asset investments are growing faster than you know the more traditional bricks and mortar tangible asset investments. Uh, now there is, of course, no one-to-one -one correlation between sort of you know investment and overall rates of economic growth. Uh, but I think it is fair to say that you know yes, we you know since the financial crisis, um, um, we have seen much weaker overall economic growth. But at least as far as the intangible um, side of the economy goes, you know companies still continue to invest. Uh, you know, significant resources in it, and you know that is reflected in our intellectual property findings. Sorry, uh, a follow-up question about this, this little dog in the country and struggling to keep up. Do you think that means that this um, some kind of, and of course the point was no responsibility in it, but do you think it, it might reflect the fact that technology <coughs> transfer and um, and help towards those countries to kind of boost their technological ability is, is, is a reflection of this, that it's just not really working. The capacity building and Look, I would be a little wary of drawing too many conclusions from uh, a, a general uh, statistic, but one of the things that I think you can say is that uh, what we are also seeing, uh, uh, in addition to what uh, Carsten has already pointed to in respect of intangible assets, but what we're also seeing is that increasingly uh, competition is conducted on the basis of, of intellectual property assets. Uh, and um, 
that means that, uh, of course, the competition is, is extremely fierce uh, in this area. Most countries and certainly most leading economies uh, have innovation as a central plank of their economic strategy. Uh, and, and so that's where we see the competitive stakes played out. Uh, now, in that context, of course, keeping up with that for anyone is a difficult matter. Jean-Pierre. Yeah. Uh, can, can I just ask you if, if the, um, I mean, the, the figures you can ask is uh, the applications um, yeah. and, and the, uh, I mean, the patents granted afterwards, is, is, is the rate stable? Or, I mean, it's, it's not just a phenomenon that uh, there's no applications, but the, the ones that are accepted at the end are, are the same as 10 years ago. Right? Uh, no, uh, I think there is a you know there is a correlation of grants growing. Uh, exactly the correlation I can't tell you. You know whether it's exactly the same number of you know two thirds granted of the applications as it was ten years ago. But yes, grants are growing uh, at the same time. Yeah. Simon. Yes, you. Sur la, sur la Chine, on voit qu'il y a beaucoup de, de demandes nationales, mais euh, relativement beaucoup moins au niveau de international. De Comment vous expliquez ce paradoxe, étant donné que la Chine est quand même une économie très tournée vers l'exportation oui, euh, ben, je pense que euh, ça fait partie de, de l'évolution de la nature de l'économie chinoise. Donc, euh, comme on sait, euh, ils sont en train de. De, de, de faire de l'innovation euh, un point central de leur stratégie économique. Euh, ils sont en train d'essayer d'ajouter de la valeur euh, à leur euh, production, euh, de, de faire le voyage de « made in China » à « created in China euh, ». Et euh, naturellement, je pense que euh, les exportations Uh, reflète l'activité traditionnelle, et, et, et pas traditionnelle, je veux dire les derniers 30 ans uh, de, de l'activité économique chinoise. Uh, et on, on voit quand même qu'il y a plus d'externalisation qu'il y en avait uh, auparavant. Uh, et je pense que uh, j'oserais à prédire qu'on va... Euh, continuer à avoir euh, cette augmentation de l'externalisation de euh, la production euh, intellectuelle de la Chine. Euh, et, euh, mais c'est certainement vrai que pour le moment, c'est peu par rapport aux chiffres nationaux. nationaux. Dans quel domaine il y a le plus de, de dépôts de... Pour la Chine. L'informatique, la télécommunication. Oui, communication numérique. Et, et l'autre, moi, ça Oui. Et Computer. Oui, informatique. What is for the China? I have to break it down, but those are the two, two categories. I'm not sure which one is the top, but I have to verify that. Those are the two top ones, but what is the ranking? I have to go back and check. Uh, so, uh, education and. Informatique. Donc, informatique en général et la uh, communication numérique. Tele telecommunication. Sorry? Telecommunication. Telecommunication is actually with the one is trying to find out whether it's there. I don't have that on my program, but I should okay. be top. We, we can check this. We can check and verify and send it. Catherine? Sure. Uh, <coughs> India, do you think the good performance of India is um, for the new IP kind of orientation of, uh, of India? So that might, um, certainly. I think certainly uh, the uh, strategy of uh, uh, made in India, uh, which uh, requires investment, of course, in manufacturing, uh, and the emphasis also that India is placing on innovation, uh, 
I think is uh, being reflected in the figures here and increased IP activity. Can I just get back to the question of the, uh, the, the percentage that is usually accepted? You have a, an overall, an average figure. We can we can get it. Yeah, we may. Okay, I'm not sure we can do it worldwide, but we can certainly do it by certain countries. We have to go back and look at the global level for the grant rate. If you look at the figures, is last year 5.2 percent increase in number of patent granted. So that's the global level. But in terms of detail by offices, we have to go back and check. Yeah, so, so, sorry. So so, we, so in, in, in generally speaking, there's around five percent of the patents no, 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 no. increase in number of number of applications granted in 2015 yeah. compared with number of applications granted yeah. in 2014. So it's not yeah. that yeah. it's not a success rate. No, we're talking about that. Yeah. But you have you have an idea. We can give you that for specific countries. No, no, but yeah. I mean, in, in, is, is it like ten percent? I know. My guess is around about two thirds, seventy percent. Yeah, seventy percent, roughly. But it's a, yeah, yeah. that's a. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's not, if I may, um, entirely straightforward to compute because in any given year, patents are granted that relate to filings that could go back uh, 10 years. True. So, yeah. you know, one has to be there careful to not compare apples with oranges. Yeah. And it's also the case um, that uh, if a patent is not granted, it doesn't necessarily mean that the office rejected it. You know, in, in, in quite a few cases, applicants decide to withdraw from the patent application process mainly because they obtain information on how the market develops on how technology develops and they may not you know find a particular patent uh, worthwhile pursuing anymore so that's why one has to take you know sort of ground rates with a slight grain of salt another reason for withdrawal also is that some companies uh, do what is called defensive publication. So they will uh, put a patent application in, wait for it to be published, and then withdraw it. And the publication prevents anyone else from patenting in that area. So, so it's, it's a. Could you repeat that? Sorry. Uh, so in some areas, uh, some country, uh, some companies uh, practice what is called defensive publica uh, publication. So uh, they're not really interested in taking out a patent right, but they are interested in ensuring that nobody else does. So the best way to do that is to make the patent applica the, the invention public. And they can do that fairly easily by filing a patent application in, for example, Canada, waiting where it's reasonably low cost, waiting for it to be published, then withdrawing their application, but it has been published, it's in the public domain, nobody else will be able to uh, patent that. So that goes on a bit in the, uh, especially in the area of uh, IT. Please. Now, also, all Swiss news agency, so we see that the gap between China and the US is growing. Uh, what kind of uh, consequences do you see in the election of Donald Trump? Or, uh, with the I was uh, wondering how it would come <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I take the responsibility. I mean, in the, with, with eventual protectionist measures, in the, the consequences for the dynamic of uh, innovation in the US and, and on the, uh, the application for patents. Okay, so I think the short answer is we don't know, uh, and um, and uh, the president-elect has not at this stage said very much about innovation, but he did feature in one of his pronouncements recently that this would be an emphasis, uh, but otherwise we don't have a policy, a general policy statement, so it's a little difficult to say. Now, in respect of the trade element, what we can say is that the United States remains clearly uh, the biggest filer uh, of applications externally. So they are uh, clearly the leader in filing applications abroad. So uh, this obviously is related to trade and investment. Uh, so they have important stakes, very important stakes uh, in uh, intellectual property and trade. So the Trump will take these all back home and then <laughs> <in> the US. <laughs>
Um, thank Francis. Sorry. One, one second. I think yeah. Stephanie yeah. and then John. So clearly, with his pronouncements on the um, so recently on the um, on the uh, Asia Pacific um, TPP, certainly that would uh, point to endangering perhaps a an advantage. Uh, well, I wouldn't say that, but uh, if you wish to, uh, you can, but I wouldn't say that. I don't think you can just just uh, immediately draw that conclusion. Yeah. I think it's early days. What would you say? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, well, uh, I think a, a particular trade uh, agreement uh, is, you know, not necessarily going to affect overall investment by United States enterprises overseas. Um, John. On related to Stephanie's question, um, some very senior advisors to President-elect Trump have mentioned that one of their priorities in the new administration come January 20 will be zero tolerance for infringements of IP. Uh, how do you see this playing out in your domain? Uh, well, I think that, uh, that counterfeiting and piracy are problems uh, in the field of intellectual property. They're complex questions uh, and they require, you know, some uh, deeper analysis to, you know, if you take piracy, for example, you uh, it's um, very much connected with the increased uh, availability of works on the internet uh, and uh, we have seen various uh, activity in that regard. For example, I think one could say that one of the things that has happened uh, is that as a consequence of new accessible business models, we see digital <coughs> sales rising. Uh, which is a suggestion or an implication, if you like, that uh, piracy levels have also decreased partly because we have good accessible business models. So you can get, as you know, uh, access to all the world's music, essentially, for about $10 uh, a month, which is uh, a rather good deal when you compare the amount that you pay for a, a, a football ticket, uh, for example. Uh, so uh, I think it's a co they're complex phenomena, counterfeiting and piracy, and I think counterfeiting is also related to globalization and, and the capacity to break up value chains uh, so that it's more difficult to, to trace. So uh, it's very, um, it, it's difficult to say anything in general. Now, uh, what President-elect Trump has said, it does, uh, it seems to me not to be uh, in any way different from the policy of the United States in general of uh, um, emphasizing the need to respect intellectual property. Yeah, um, I'd like to ask you about uh, South African, because it's the dominant fire from Africa. Africa. Mm. Um, but most of the filings are non resident. Is it possible for you to connect with that? Well, I think that's fairly typical uh, of uh, actually all countries in the world, with very, very few exceptions. There are probably two or three exceptions. You, China is the one where most of the non resident filing. Right. But uh, uh, imagine something like India, Brazil, South Africa. You have big chunk coming from the non-Brazilian Not only the, uh, India, Brazil, uh, South Africa, but also Australia, Canada. Uh, and I w always would be a little bit careful with this um, comparison because what you are comparing is home production against the rest of the world's production. So very few countries will be able to have a home production which beats the total production, or if you like, of all other countries. So it's fairly natural that you get a, a high level of non-resident filing since it's the rest of the world. Uh, so uh, I think the South African figures are fairly typical in this regard. Is it, is it possible to do the comment on what type of filing? I, I couldn't without it. We, we would have to analyse it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so, 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 I mean, to, to protect the, the new product properly, you still have to file it in every country. You, you, you 
Yeah. Well, I think you then get into uh, patenting strategies, and and generally, uh, you know, they will follow the uh, plans of a company as to the markets in which it which wishes to be operate uh, to operate. First of all. Uh, and secondly, the capacity of countries to be able to imitate. So, um, but I mean, th theoretically, if you if your product is not regist uh, registered or protected in, a, in one country, it can be copied there without. It can indeed, but uh, the capacity to export from that country is limited by the protection that has been taken else out oh, elsewhere. Okay, yeah, sure. So <laughs> it's not a sort of free for all. Uh, but there are, you know, some fairly uh, major examples. I could give you, give you just an anecdotal example um, of uh, the Rubik's Cube, um, which was the subject of some litigation, actually, in, in the trademark area recently in the European Court. But when Mr. Rubik took out patent protection for the Rubik's Cube, uh, his resources didn't permit him to, or in his decision at any rate, was to take out protection only in Europe and North America. Mm -hmm. Now, it became a fantastic hit in Asia, uh, and zillions of Rubik's Cubes were manufactured in Asia and, and sold in Asia without any patent protection whatsoever, so he was unable to earn anything from that. So it's a rather strategic decision to take. Coming back to what you mentioned about the uh, supply chains, uh, what are the figures showing in tracing technologies? Are you getting a lot of patents filed in this area where the, uh, the technology is embedded in the product and it's traced right across the supply chain all the way to the retail level? Well, uh, Carsten and colleagues are hard at work on this. So, <laughs> Yeah, in fact, our next World Intellectual Property Report, which that we aim to publish <laughs> in 2015, um, uh, will be on the topic of global value chains and, and intangible assets. So we hope to shed some light on it. Um, I mean, what I can definitely tell you, I mean, and I don't think that um, you know, is much rocket science behind it, you look at the products that are traded in international supply chain and you look at the companies uh, who um, you know, do the R&D behind it, uh, who are the ones who uh, retail uh, these products around the world, I mean clearly there's a lot of IP involved. I mean just think of, uh, you know, think of, of, of smartphones, think of tablet computers, uh, you know, there are a large number of um, patent rights, design rights uh, filed on these types of products and clearly you know, these are products where you have highly fragmented uh, value added chains uh, involving lots of, lots of countries. Um, but it's precisely an in interesting question and you know, that's where we are trying to um, have a closer look. You know, where precisely do those companies file their patents and what is the role of patents uh, in managing technology within these value added chains? Uh, you know, clearly confidentiality uh, contractual type of arrangements would also play a role, um, but we don't yet have a good answer to that. No, my question was, are you seeing an increased trend in the filings of such tracing technologies, some are very sophisticated, where the potential infringer wouldn't be, even be aware uh, that yeah. the technology is okay. in the product that yeah. he's trying to infringe? Mm. We couldn't answer that without yeah. doing a patent landscape. I yeah. mean, it's possible to do it, but uh, we yeah. don't have the answer okay. off the top of our head. Yeah. It's the same applying in, uh, in the yeah. internet as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, can you explain a bit um, about Japan? Um, I understood mm. uh, in terms of patent application is the only country among the five that has been declined mm -hmm. uh, last year. Uh, first, is it the first year Japan is declining? No. No, uh, no it's a uh, recent trend mm -hmm. uh, in the number of domestic applications that is uh, filed in Japan that has been declining slightly. Uh, but at the same time, we've seen that as a general trend, the number of international applications filed by Japan has been increasing. So it reflects a change of patenting behavior, uh, you see. So Japanese enterprises, their share of international patent applications has been rising, uh, you know, Quite in a quite healthy manner, and their numbers of international patent applications have been rising. But the number that they're filing internally uh, is smaller overall. 
uh, and it, it's a, it is a change that you know the Japanese enterprises will uh, talk about of behaviour, uh, of focusing on key um, technologies, uh, perhaps not patenting around them as much as they once did, uh, and that in turn as a as a as a um, guess or a supposition can also. Uh, you could also say that perhaps that also reflects over time the higher value or the more basic nature of the inventions that are coming out of Japanese industry. So they're less incremental and more basic. Uh, but that's a you know, fairly big statement that I'm making, but I think that a lot of people would say that, that this is one of the things that's happening. Is, is there, does it also reflect the fact that the uh, domestic market is Somehow, mm. because I know Panasonic, Canon, Toyota mm -hmm. are filing a lot of mm. applications, right? uh, more and more abroad, as you said. Uh, is it just that they lost faith in the domestic market? Mm. I couldn't comment on that. I, I don't think that's the case, but um, I, I think it's more related to what I said. Mm. They, they, the way in which they're strategizing uh, uh, for their farming. Questions? Thank you very much. Carlton, I think for the last few years you said you were going to do an exercise to collect data on the, uh, the potential cash flow of all these inventions, in other words, <coughs> the royalty trends lead to patents and trademarks. What happened to that research? Well, I don't think that's entirely correct. You always asked us to do that. <laughs> And uh, um, uh, I don't think we have ever committed uh, to doing that. <laughs> Listen, we would like to, if we could. It's just very difficult, if not impo impossible. The problem is that um, you know, any type of licensing arrangements are usually um, concluded between private parties. There is no uh, official measurement of these. There is no reporting requirement. Uh, so um, you know, there is no you know, obvious data source that you can uh, turn to to address this. At the international the, the level... The thing are royalty yes. uh, trends globally, so there is a royalty statistical databases. Well, there is internationally, you would find some data on royalties and license fees in the, in the balance of payments. Um, that is data, you know, that we've talked about in our past reports. You get some interesting information out of that, but one should also be extremely cautious in using those data, um, mainly because they often relate to intra-company payments of royalties and license fees uh, that have to do with, uh, with profit uh, shifting. Again, I might refer you to next year's World IP report, where we try to document uh, that and provide a little bit of background analysis on that. But, um, no, listen, I think it's, uh, it, it's a topic, you know, where many uh, of my colleagues also in, in intellectual property offices around the world struggle with. Uh, um, you know, I think they, from the viewpoint of those who analyze uh, the intellectual property system, it would be great to have much greater um, information on what happens to patents after they are granted. I think the Director General has also you know, pointed that out uh, on, on occasions. In practice, it's just very difficult to do. There have been a number of attempts to do this through surveys, and they have largely failed because, you know, companies have not responded simply because they consider that confidential information. Um, so that remains a highly, highly challenging area of measurement. That's for private, private companies, yes. not public listed. They would have to show the cash flow from, from yes. that segment. Yes, so you, you would, that is correct, you would find some data in, uh, for example, Security and Exchange Commission filings, uh, but again, that's, that's highly aggregated data, um, you know, for IBM you would find, you know, licensing receipts of, I think, more than a billion dollars, uh, so it is true for selected companies, you would find that, but even with those kind of data points, it's very hard to sort of establish a systemic picture. Um, Thank you very much, and Thank you. I guess it's yep. happy holidays. Oh, yeah. you don't see